Well, good evening, everyone, and Jennifer, and uh, welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I am Sandy Shellis, joined by my partner, Jennifer. It's great to see you, Jennifer. Hi. It's good to see you, too. I'm so excited about our show tonight. We've got oh, a lot yeah. of really good materials, and we're going around the world. Well, yeah, we are. We are. We're actually um, going to start with a little art show, and it's going to be interesting. The artist's name is Marty McCorkle, and Marty is a follower of ours, but I met Marty first on... Uh, Collapse Chronicles. Oh, you and did? And Marty is a prolific commentator when Marty has something to commentate about. And then I found Marty, or Marty found me, on uh, Twitter. And mm -hmm. that's where I saw Marty's artwork. Marty lives in Southeast oh, wow. Asia. So it's very interesting. And then we have, of course, you know, you'll do your, your, your viewpoint of what the rest of the things we're going to do, but... I'll just shout out to Matt and Kim. Our moderators are here and uh, lots of stuff. So, Jen, you want to give the, besides what I just did, the uh, million foot yeah. overview? Yeah. I don't know all the different things that we're going to do, Sandy, because they, they oh. look fabulous, but I don't know <laughs> all of them, what they all are. Right. Well, you've got the main stuff but up. I do have, we are going to dive into a very competitive, complex and interesting article from the lancet this is actually a journal and uh, it's about national responsibility for fair ecological breakdown a fair shares yep. assessment of resource use yep from the years 1970 to 2017 and it's actually pretty revealing so we're going to go through <sighs> Very that interesting mm-hmm and then we have a bunch of different tweets, I believe, Sandy, that you're going to be showing. And, well, yeah, uh, if we get a chance, we'll, we'll just show yeah. you what's in the Twitter sphere of climate change. Yeah. And then I guess uh, there's been some flooding in, in Accra, Ghana. So we're going to talk about the flooding in Ghana. You know, they were hit by some sort of rain bomb. Awful. Yeah. And then that's about it, isn't it? Or is there more? Oh, this. Oh, we have. Oh no, we're gonna wind up with Dolly Parton. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we're winding up with a high note, and I'm not gonna attempt to do her high note. <laughs> no, but uh, this is gonna be fun. So, le well, let's get started. I wanna. I'm gonna do the Marty Art Show. All right. So as I explain, Marty McCorkle is an amazing artist. And uh, let me first show just one of Marty's beautiful pieces here. It's a um, let me get us in, in the in the Marty sphere. OK, do we Here's... have Marty's artwork behind us tonight? Sandy? Yes, we sure do. This is a Marty artwork and it's on it's on his Twitter when I get there. I'm just going to show you some stuff, guys, that uh, a little bit close up in the mediums. Marty works in different mediums, but the, the, the art is just absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And so this is one piece. And I then, love the rays of light. So oh, beautiful. isn't it beautiful? I just mm -hmm. thought we needed we needed an eye massage. Mm -hmm. We did. We we need mm -hmm. some beauty in our lives. And here's a, a, a this is another beautiful piece. I love this one also. And the trees and see the dog in the middle of the trees. Oh. Let me see if I can make this one a little bit smaller. And uh, okay, so that one is really sweet. I love the brush strokes. It's really nice. That is yes, Marty is quite an art artist. Oh my God! And and here's one that's the big bigger version of what's behind us. Look at that beautiful butterfly. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's an American butterfly. <laughs> it's got red, white, and blue. And there, Marty's giving us the American butterfly. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little shot of Marty's Twitter, and I got a little. A little um, 
music to put on as we go through Marty's Twitter. It's very pretty. Uh, here's one. This was from September of 2021. Beautiful stuff. And, oh, he, he had a, that's a, that's, we're not going to go there. We're just going to show the art. Isn't it beautiful? So beautiful. It is. I want you guys to go. Oh, there's one I, that's one I showed. Yes. Mm. It's always nice to, to share some, a fellow, and, and we have other artists that follow us. And one of our newest followers, Midas Lisa, is an artist, and she's doing oils. And I hope to do the same thing to show hers. Hers, look at this. Isn't that absolutely spectacular? Let's see if I can get it a little bigger. Just to look at that. This, that's beautiful. Beauty. It really is. Beauty. Just look at, and that's what we needed was some beauty. And, uh, oh, look at this. Oh, my God. Oh, I would love one Marty oh, McCorkle. That's glorious. Yeah. You know, guys, my birthday's coming up. Anytime anybody would like. <laughs> I'd love a Marty McCorkle. <laughs> All uh, right. So let me show you um, Marty's um, website. And I'll have the I'll have the links up. Um, Marty's recent sketches. There are there's all different kinds of things from uh, many, many, many years. Um, just different people, different here. Here's one I really like too. Isn't that pretty? 2017. Oh my God. Isn't that lovely? Riding a flying so, horse. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Just beautiful. And let's see what else. Oh my gosh. And you can, you know, just all different kinds of, but because Southeast Asia, you know, I, I know living amongst an island is beautiful. Look at the form of the body. Mm. Look at the form. Wow. So I guess you guys can get the idea of how we wanted to start with beauty. Because sometimes amongst all of our angst and all of the things that are happening, we can see beauty. Beauty amongst us. So, so beautiful. If you're, yes. So if you guys are interested in just even, it's like being in a museum in your own home, looking at the artwork. So if you want to sit in a museum in your own home and look at art, I highly, re I highly recommend this site. Okay? I think it's beautiful. So I'm 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 really happy that uh I got to share. Mm, it's so gorgeous. Art. What do you think? Pretty. Very I beautiful. Have, I bet you have a beautiful home with art filled with art. And I have a home filled with art that I've collected over what? 35 plus years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's go to uh, get serious now that we've showed the beautiful artwork of Marty, and let's begin our show. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you want to then um, go through yeah. the beginnings of the Lancet article, yeah. and I will pull yeah, it up. Absolutely. All right, let's look absolutely. at the Lancet. All right, guys. Here we go. This is the this is where we get really ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Sandy, this is a journal, right? The yes. Lancet. This is the journal. Yeah. And okay, this is their planetary health, and it was not behind a paywall. That's that's really was a a, a thing that I was impressed with that it wasn't behind a paywall, and that also. It was it was something of interest. It's not like this group doesn't understand this topic, right? But mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see it. And I thought, well, if you wanted to go, we have Professor Jason Hickel, who is a he's with uh, the International Inequalities Institute in London School of Economic and Political Science. And uh, we have Daniel O'Neill, Ph.D., Sustainable Research Institute. So it's a U.K. Well, Lancet 
is UK. And it is a, it's, it's qualitative. It's a study. It's using data and bringing data in from uh, a lot of different resources to, to, to make this work. So Jen, would you like to mm -hmm. start? Okay. Absolutely. Right. <clears throat> so did you guys know that overshoot can be calculated at a very fine level? So that's what this is about. Yes. National responsibility for ecological breakdown, <clears throat> a fair shares assessment of resource use 1970 to 2017. So human impacts on earth system processes are overshooting several planetary boundaries driving a crisis of ecological breakdown. This mm -hmm. crisis is being caused in large, in large part by global resource extraction, which has increased dramatically over the past half century. We propose a novel method for quantifying national responsibility for ecological breakdown by assessing nation's cumulative material use in excess of equitable and sustainable boundaries. So for this analysis, we derived national fair shares of sustainable resource corridor. These fair shares were then subtracted from country's actual resource use to determine the extent right. which each country has overshot its fair share over the period of 1970 to 2017. <clears throat> Through this approach, each country's share of responsibility for global excess resource use was calculated. Kind of fascinating mm -hmm. how it you can is. calculate this. Yeah, I'm all so, into the methods. <laughs> right. So overall, the findings so not surprisingly, guys, high income nations are responsible for 74% of global excess material use, driven primarily by the USA, 27%. Yeah, rah, rah. And, and the EU, 28 high income countries, 25%. So Europe and the United States, roughly equal. Yeah. China is actually responsible for 15% of global excess material use. And this is a newcomer into the fray, and we'll show how that is. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the global south, the low-income and middle-income countries of Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, and Middle East, and Asia, is responsible for only 8%. So it's really Europe, the United States, and China. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Overshoot in higher income nations is driven disproportionately by the use of abiotic materials, whereas lower income nations, it is driven disproportionately by use of biomass. Oh. So the yeah, so the overall interpretation, the results show that the high income nations are primary drivers of global ecological breakdown and they need to urgently reduce their resource use to fair and sustainable levels yeah, achieving right. sufficient reductions will likely require high-income nations to adopt transformative post-growth and degrowth approaches wow so human impacts on Earth system processes are overshooting several planetary boundaries, not only in terms of CO2 emissions and climate change, but also land use change, biodiversity loss, chemical pollution, and biogeochemical flows. The current rate of biodiversity loss is particularly concerning. In a, comp in a comprehensive review of extant evidence, the UN Intergovernmental Science Policy, Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecologic System Services found that on our present trajectory, around 1 million species mm. are now at risk of extinction, many within decades. This trend is indicative of widespread habitat fragmentation, ecosystem disruption, and ecological breakdown. These problems are being driven in large part by global resource use, 
through processes of material extraction, production, consumption, and waste. Resource use has a range of impacts on terrestrial and marine ecosystems, including on forests, soils, wetlands, lakes, rivers, and oceans, and resource use is understood to be a robust proxy for environmental pressure. Steinman and colleagues showed that resource use accounts for more than 90% of the variation in environmental damage indicators. The UN International Resource Panel found that resource use is responsible for 90% of total global biodiversity loss and water stress. Moreover, as hmm. Vandervaat and colleagues showed, although impacts vary by material as technologies change, there is a link between aggregate mass flows and ecological impact with correlation coefficient of 0.73. Although differences between individual materials are important, aggregate material use is a key indicator for environmental policy. Mm -hmm. Global material use has increased markedly over the past half century to the point where as of 2017, wow. <clears throat> the world's economy is consuming over 90 billion tons of materials per year, well in excess of what industrial ecologists consider to be a sustainable limit. The increasing trend holds across all categories of materials, including biomass, metals, non-metallic materials, and fossil fuels. However, not all nations are equally responsible for this trend. Some nations use substantially more resources per capita than others. Hmm. Although previous research has explored the question of national responsibility for CO2, emissions and climate change, such analysis has not been applied to other forms of environmental pressure. In this study, we quantify the national responsibility for ecological damages related to excess material use using a method rooted in the principle that the planet's resources and ecosystems are a commons and that people are entitled to an equal sustainable share. This principle has been articulated in the climate literature and the approach here builds on a method that was developed for CO2 emissions. All right, so we have now the research in context, the evidence before <coughs> the study. Um, do you want me to take it? All mm -hmm. right. It, so the existing research, it has shown that global resource use markedly exceeds sustainable levels. And it is driving a crisis of ecological breakdown, um, you know, endangering planetary health. Research has also found that the higher income nations, the little, you know, people that overconsume like we do, uh, is driving this crisis endangering planetary health so the research also has found that you know have the higher um, income nations have a per capita resource use than lower income nations and these nations also exceed sustainability threshold to a greater extent so however to date there has been no attempt to quantify national responsibility for the cumulative excess of global resource use that is driving this ecological crisis. So we will say yay for this one because they are doing it. Added value of this study. This study advances existing research. <clears throat> um, by assessing the extent to which nations exceed equitable and sustainable resource use corridors in terms of cumulative material consumption. So they use the data to quantify national responsibility for excess global from the period of 70 to 2017. 
All right, so implications. The results of this analysis indicate that the high income nations are the primary drivers of the global ecological breakdown and must urgently reduce their resource use. See, no, notice they don't say just emissions. I mean, this is overall. Right. This is overall. And it, it, to, they ha we have to stop it, given the evidence between the strong coupling between economic growth and resource use. This will likely require high-income nations to adopt transformative post-growth and degrowth degrowth approaches and I have to do this. Hopefully it is not. I'm doing this for Matt right here. This is for Matt. He's our mod. Without the magical thinking, Matt can't go on through the show. So this is my geek out time for the methods. And I, I won't get too, you know, too geeky, but mm -hmm. I was looking at the quantifying material use and two primary methodolog methodological issues they require attention. The first is the extent to which your nation's resource can be reasonably considered to contribute to ecological breakdown on a global level. So with CO2 emissions, national Emissions have global effects. I was just saying they didn't use emissions, but they're just using it illustratively here. So with CO2, they, okay, something similar is true of resource use, see? So we're going on to take, okay, CO2, no, resource use. National emissions have global effects. Something similar is true of resource use. Given the reality of international trade, particularly in an era of globalization and complex commodity supply chains, material flows data reveal that the products consumed in any given country rely on resources extracted from many countries around the world. An iPad, for instance, it involves uh, the materials from 748 international suppliers oh consumption God. yeah it's insane consumption of ipads and we're using it all i mean who's here is watching us technologically we're using it all this is right. interesting as hell so consumption of ipads and similar items in in the usa or sweden it has impacts on countries ranging from china to bolivia to the the congo um global Economic integration and globalized nature of resource supply chains makes it necessary to think about national resource use in terms of aggregate ecological pressure. So quantifying the national use of these resources, the two indicators are, avail are available. One is domestic material consumption. So remember, DMC, which represents the total mass of imports minus mass of exports okay we're gonna look wow. at the, the yeah. interesting huh yeah isn't it isn't it the mass of imports yeah. minus the mass of exports although this metric accounts for trade to some degree it does not include the upstream material extraction required to produce traded goods this is huge jennifer the it second is. metric yeah, it's putting it all in one place it's laying it out uh, the second metric is material footprint. So we have the first one, which was the DMC, and then the material footprint, also known as raw material consumption. The MF accounts for it accounts not only for domestic extraction and the mass of traded goods, but also for the upstream material extraction required to produce these goods. For example, although DMC includes the mass of an imported smartphone. The MF includes the smartphone plus the materials involved in the supply chains that produce it. So by right. accounting for the, yeah, it's, it's, I love the way they've set it up. They, 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 by accounting for these dynamics, the MF re uh, represents the total materials embodied in national final demand. 
Given the dynamics of offshore production and global supply chains, the MF data are preferable to DMC data when it comes to assessing the contributions of national consumption to ecological breakdowns. See, articles like this that lay it out, Jennifer, can maybe give policymakers something to start with. It's a building block for policymakers. So, well, yeah. because it tears it all apart and it's an honest look at what it's taking to create all these products that we consume. Absolutely. And it gives, you know, it's an understanding here, recognizing that the international nature of material flows allows us to resolve questions that might arise from a more methodolo methodologically territorial perspective. For instance, one might argue that countries such as Finland and Costa Rica should not be penalized for resource use in the same way as countries such as Brazil and the USA on grounds that resource extraction in the former countries is more heavily regulated. And uh, maybe I lost my place. Okay, and uses more sustainable technologies than in the latter countries. So it represents less ecological impact per ton of material extracted. But although Finland might apply stronger regulatory standards to its own domestic extraction, it does not apply those same standards to extraction embodied in products <laughs> and intermediate parts mm -hmm. imported from abroad. <laughs> when accounting right. for the complexity of global commodity chains, differences in national regulatory frameworks and technological endowments become less important. So consumption in Finland evolves around resources extracted in Brazil. While consumption in Brazil involves resources extracted in Finland, and no one can tell me that this is not a global world order, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe I need to put that in. It's the global world order. Yeah, there we go. Are you scared now, guys? Because everybody's, everybody's using stuff. <laughs> All right, so anyway, let's go down and say, although that this resource entails the ecological pressure some level of resource use is of course necessary for sustaining human society and countries with larger populations will therefore um rely oh i keep losing my place <laughs> Change the, oh therefore require the more baseline resource use than countries with smaller populations so considering this our focus should be not on national resource use, uh, you know, as such, i.e. in absolute terms, but rather on some metric of excess resource use, which, God, here in the United States, right? Um, measured with respect to a conception of fair shares that is grounded in principles of equality and sustainability. So are you with us, guys? It's fascinating shit. I hope you are, because we're going through the whole thing. Um, and okay, I'm going to finish this, this section, then we're tag teaming it. And then Jennifer is okay. going to take it up. So one straightforward method to account for equi equity is to assess the extent to which nations per capita resource use excludes the global mean per capita level. So these are, you know, e economist terms. This approach has been used to quantify nations quant contributions to the global CO2 emissions. The limitation of the approach is that it works for modest levels of global resource use. It makes little sense to assume that aggregate resource use can increase indefinitely from an ecological perspective, some kind of upper limit or boundary similar to those that are used in climate policy like the 350 ppm planetary boundary or the 1.5 C, 2 C limits could be posited beyond which any aggregate resource use would be considered excessive regardless, regardless how it's distributed. So quantifying, how are we gonna quantify? Mm -hmm. How are we doing this? It's impossible to pinpoint precise boundaries for any complex geophysical process such as 
an exercise, you know, an exercise will always include uncertainty and have a normative element. This is true for resource use, just as it is for atmospheric CO2 concentrations, ocean pH, land use change, and other processes represented in the planetary boundaries framework. However, the boundary is somewhere and it is clear that it has already exceeded. You know, it's already been exceeded, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay. Industrial ecologists have proposed that a sustainable boundary for global resource might be around 50 billion tons per year. Global resource use exceeded the level in 1997. So here we are. The level is generally considered to be an upper limit boundary. Bringzu proposes a target sustainability quarter of about 20 to 50 billion tons per year, gigatons, divided by, and I forgot what A was. Uh, global resource use exceeded that, 25 gigatons in 1970 so pretty much here are the operationalized the sustainability corridor when aggregate resource use was between 25 gigatons divided by what was the a jennifer what's wrong with me see i, I, I don't know fart. what the a is I, okay i studied this today and I yeah don't know what, and but you can see guys the numbers we've exceeded numbers and they're taking instead of using gigatons of co2 they're using it and quantifying pretty much crap <laughs> i mean it sounds terrible to say but yeah. stuff so they set a, a a level of global resource use how much how much did we use in all of these different things and so they come up with these statistical analysis which i find pretty cool i don't know what they use when they work in their statistics i didn't look if they do they use spss anymore things have changed since um i was doing a a lot of heavy analysis. But so this approach, they used population data from the World Bank. This approach allows them to determine each country's fair share of the boundary in each year. Note that these fair shares are not static. They change over time, T, as population changes, which is the, you know, national, mm -hmm. national, the air share equals the boundary. They use population and they go in with the global population on their analysis. Here is how they use the other, the other analysis they use. When national resource was larger than the national fair share, the difference between those quantities, um, let's see, the quantities, uh, national overshoot equals national resource use, national air, uh, air, the national F, F air share in all other years, it was defined as zero. So as you can see, each, each, every level of, of research, every level of indicating what they wanted to find out is being used in all these different analysis. And this one was interesting, the national responsibility. And then they're using the, um, 2017, 1970 as the T and the national overshoot and global overshoot. So I found it pretty interesting and I had gone back and forth looking at my old statistics references and all, but mm -hmm. of course I'm not a stat, you know, I haven't done statistics in years since I left my job. And back in the day, mm -hmm. all these companies started building statistical analysis programs that were plug in for just what I did. Do you use statistics right. in your job, Jen? Um, well, sometimes, not too much, but I'd like to take a closer look at this equation because it's actually very interesting. All so right. like most equations, which one? This it's one. The national responsibility All equals right. the national overshoot over the global overshoot. So it's actually the change in the national overshoot between there we go. 2000 between 1970 and 2017. So that rate of change divided by that rate of change in the same time period That's of the global overshoot. overshoot. You take those two things and that is your national responsibility. So that's why I really wanted to just slow down here okay. and see and say 
you can calculate the national responsibility. I mean, wow. it's almost like morality, <laughs> you know, it's kind of amazing. It is amazing. I love the way that they, uh, hmm. they compared how CO2 yeah. is measured and how they've done this with, with, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, so I are you going to cool. pass it over to me finally? I'm going to pass it over. Here okay. we go. Do I have a pass it over sound? <laughs> finally. I don't think so. Okay. Ideally, <laughs> we would have used MF. And remind me again, Sandy, what is MF? It's material footprint, right? Yeah. MF I'd have to go back material up because I don't remember anything. Yeah. So ideally, we would have used MF data for the full analysis period. Material. However, the best MF data available published by the UN Environment Sorry, Program for, International yeah. Resource Panel <clears throat> only covers the period from 1991 to 2017. And they're going back to 1970s. Yeah. So they've, they're missing 20 years of data otherwise. So that's why they're doing it that way. Moreover, the first year of these data contains some anomalies due to the dissolution of the former Soviet Union. Therefore, we constructed an approximation of the material footprint for the years 1970 to 91 using DMC data. And again, Sandy, do you remember what DMC? Yeah, I have to go all the way back because I have a horrible memory. So in my methods, the DMC of making people dizzy was the domestic material yeah. consumption. Domestic material okay. consumption. See if I can remember that. The, the domestic terrible. material consumption. Yeah. Which are available um, for most countries back to 1970. Be yep. Because the DMC data for former Eastern Bloc countries only began in the early 1990s, we disaggregated the data from the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and Czech, Czechoslovakia, not even the Czech Republic, right. to estimate the values for modern day countries back to 1970. Wow, they disaggregated it, so they had to kind of reverse engineer it. It's pretty funny. All right. Anyway, um, we that this is very nerdy, guys. I'm just telling it you. It is. You We're nerding out. Nerd. And you know what? Really it's okay nerdy. to nerd out. It's really okay. So let's okay. nerd out. Okay. I'm enjoying okay. it. Here we go. Okay, guys, put your little thinking caps on. We then index the DMC data for all countries to the year 1992 and multiplied this index series by the MF, Material Footprint, yep. data for 1992, yielding an approximation of the material footprint over the 1970 to 91 period. We joined these data with real material footprint data from 92 onwards so they had to kind of like normalize everything wow, they did due to the dissolution of the soviet union so i can tell wow yeah it's it's they're creating their own little normalized data warehouse yes, and other and it's yeah. going to be great for other researchers to extrapolate off this <clears throat> absolutely as our data series is not a true material footprint for the full time period, we, re we refer to it as material use or resource use throughout this article. Although these data capture the year on year changes in both domestic extraction and traded goods, they do not capture any changes in the upstream material extraction required to produce traded goods before 1992. However, from 1992 to 2017, the data do fully capture these changes. The data set covers 163 <sighs> countries and accounts for 99% of cumulative global material extraction over the whole period of analysis. So they basically created a normalized data warehouse for a 50 year period. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool because it's good. Well, as we're going to see, we're going to see the results. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so getting down to the results, nearly yeah. two, 
Two to five trillion tons of materials were extracted and used globally from 1970 to 2017. Wow, they were able to come up with a, with a number tons, for the tons the of materials <laughs> extracted over a 50-year period. Holy moly. With a higher income. <laughs> yeah, with higher income and upper, this must have been somebody's passion to build this thing. It's Nobody's going to pay you to put this together, and it's so needed, right? Look, yeah, right. So this was mostly for high-income and upper-middle-income countries using the vast majority of the resources, who are using the vast majority of the resources. Of this, one trillion tons were used in access of the Sustainable Corridor. Oh high-income countries, according to World Bank classifications, were collectively responsible for 74% of cumulative Cumulative. excess material use. And the upper middle income countries were responsible for 25% of cumulative excess of material use. Lower middle income countries and low income countries were collectively responsible for less than 1%. So now the truth comes out. Yeah, and Jennifer, it's like, our audience and and a lot of people maybe not everybody but a lot of people following us they knew this Mm -hmm. but now it's quantifiable because we always are saying you know about the countries that 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 that, that these other countries have basically nothing and here's the look look at the income level on this graph Yeah. yeah And you can see that the upper middle income still is sort of a Johnny come lately and the lower middle income doesn't even rate. Predominantly, everything is the high income. Yeah, the people (laughs) that bomb Of which we, uh, you can't even see the yellow on the graph. No, you can't. I don't know if I need to make it any bigger, but I, listen, can you guys see the yellow? No. No, you can't see the yellow. I I read the articles and and one that stuck with me, and I think I might have shared it or made a meme out of it, was Bombardier came out with a a new jet, brand new jet, and it's like billions. I mean, it costs millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Why are companies making fucking jets? And we're reading about how we've overshot pretty much everything in use of of uh, yeah. of material goods. So this was yeah, the cumulative well, of excess. If we ever wanted to have a prayer of getting out of our predicament, which I don't think we do have a prayer of it at this point, we should ban wars because we should outlaw oh wars. God. Really, because What's wars are. Now? I mean, you just, you just can't even get a grip on anything else. It's just horrendous. How do you ban war when you have people that have personality defects that like it? I mean, we've been a warring species since they were putting heads on spikes and way before that. I know. It's just it's not now our nature. Is, no, we're a horrible not species. It's not <laughs> our nature. God, that's, that sounds so terrible. No, it does. It's not our so let's see here. We have another table, and we can go down. If we yeah. want, we can look at this this next one, which is basically, if we don't want to read the whole thing, we can show you the results for, here, we'll just look at the, the graph. Share of responsibility for excess resource use by region. Mm-hmm. And this is another example of the USA yeah. being the worst here. Yeah, yeah. Share well, it's it's, it's it's not, okay, so, yes, the USA is the worst. Okay, that's true. But there's another way to look at it. Since it's cumulative, you can kind yeah. of see that the amount, see that white yeah. bit there? Mm-hmm. The rest of Europe of and Europe. high-income countries, that thing is going up. As well as <clears throat> what's most interesting is the green. China is very much just lately come into this. You can see in 2000, they weren't even registering on this. And now no, they're and we kind made of... Them. And we made them. Definitely. The West. Yeah, you still can't go the, into a dollar But the U.S. is, you know, a solid contributor. <laughs> 20, a solid 27% Unreal. contributor. As well as uh, EU plus the U.K. That's the other solid contributor. Yep. 
All right, now yeah. we have another figure. Oh, this was the one I really like. Annual overshoot per capita, per capita, per person, capita, with countries with the mm -hmm. largest total overshoot. Overshoot in high-income co nations is substantially more intensive than overshoot among uh, their lower-income counterparts. Mm -hmm. Australia's per capita right. overshoot is four times higher than China's and seven times higher than Brazil's. Now, figure well, four, this one, look at this. The mean because annual per capita. Go ahead. Because it's per, it's per capita, yep. right? And so Australia has comparatively small peop, a number of people when you compare right. it to China, right? Yep. But they're, they've got all that coal mining. They've got all Brilliant. that resource extraction. And so all of that goes against the smaller amount of people, which is why Australia comes out on top. That's why it is. <sighs> Same with Canada. All that resource extraction, Canada doesn't have many people. So per capita, Canada comes in second. 15 you know? of the largest absolute overshooters. Yes, Jennifer, I, I, you mm -hmm. compliment me so well. <laughs> there we go. I know tons of overshoot per capita. We overshoot, yeah. overshoot, overshoot. All right. Now we have cumulative <laughs> excess resource used by country and income group. That's hmm. right. Take this one. So it's, it's pretty interesting that per capita, the high income people use way more than just even the upper middle income people because they purchase really expensive toys. We're not talking about face creams on Amazon here, you know? <laughs> no. Right? <laughs> no, we're talking about bombardier yeah. jets. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. we're talking about very expensive toys. Think yachts, think jets, yes. think crazy homes with, you know, 10,000 square feet and a swimming pool and a, you know, air controlled, basketball court you know that uses up a lot of stuff you know and the, the lower middle income they are proportionately much much lower so this is kind of an exponential relationship and you can tell that because that's got a big curve going from the low income to the high income in terms of resource utilization so interesting i love when you explain it <laughs> it makes me happy, Jennifer. Uh, and so happy. the countries, here they are. Right. All right, so up here was the, okay, so here we are. And this one is a movable one. So let's go look, look at the USA. Got. Look at the rate weight, the ratio. Where's the, where's the, oh, Cubans have overshoot, share of global overshoot. I can't, it's not like a movable spreadsheet where I could keep the, yeah. the this up. So, but here we go. Look yeah. at that. So we can see. Mm -mm -mm. Well, guys, you can see for yourself the, the countries uh, with this, with the cumulative overshoot and the share of global overshoot. That's uh, right. And, it, it, and then broke, broken down here, like you said. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. Also guys the world totals <laughs> here's the hundred percent all right income groups are based on the world bank income classification as of fiscal year 219 for calendar year 217 the classification is static across the whole period so the analysis doesn't account for movement of countries between income groups all right but results for all the countries are available in, in Appendix 1. So there's a lot of, there are, there's Appendix, there's, you get this in PDF, all of the graphs are in, you can just click on figures, it's very nice, nicely done. So mm -hmm. here's the one. <sighs> so I think we can jump down to the discussion. All right, Sandy. Let's go to the discussion. The, the fair shares approach articulated here in offers a novel method for quantifying national responsibility for ecological breakdown this was new i had never seen it put forth am i in the right method. place i don't know let me see what you're looking this says the word discussion after all those charts now you're going okay. backwards why are you going backwards 
Sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> Their discussion. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Let's go. Um, Right. Furthermore, the majority of ecological pressure from excess consumption in rich nations is outsourced to poor nations. According to recent analysis, more than 50% of excess consumption in rich, na rich nations is net appropriated from poorer nations in the global south. This appropriation not only causes ecological damage in poor nations, but depletes them from the material resources that oh. they could otherwise use to provide for human needs and expand their sovereign industrial capacity. Our results show mm. that high income nations need to urgently scale down aggregate resources aggregate resource use to sustainable levels right mm -hmm. on average resource use needs to decline by at least 70 percent to reach the sustainable range what that's radical who's gonna reduce 70 percent do you think it's gonna happen i don't <laughs> Such reductions <laughs> were, will require, I mean, this is all well and good in one of these very brainy papers where they've worked it all out. But is yeah, it really but it, like I happen? said, it, it could be for policymakers, a baseline or, or a, uh, yeah. we could try to reach this. Yeah. yeah. Such reductions will require strong legislation on both domestic extraction and material footprints. The European Parliament recently took steps in this direction by calling the European Commission to adopt binding targets to reduce resource footprints by 2030 and break them within planetary boundaries by 2050. Oh, God. Too late. Yeah. Oh, no. Thank you for playing. Yeah. Um, it is unlikely that such reductions can be achieved while pursuing economic growth. Well, there, that's the rub, ain't it? That's there the is, rub. That's the rub. Or or the magical thinking. Yeah, there, there this is it. Yes. There is no evidence of long-term absolute decoupling of economic growth from resource use occurring either in historical data or in modeled projections or either <clears throat> even under high efficiency scenarios. In other words, not a snowball's chance in hell. In hell. No. Indeed, global gross domestic product GDP and global resource use are tightly coupled and have increased in parallel for 50 years, despite substantial technological innovation and an increase in contribution of services to GDP. Therefore, the transition to sustainable levels of resource use will probably require adopting transformative post-growth and degrowth approaches, Wonderful. including abandoning GDP growth as a goal. Do you think yeah. that's going to happen? I Not don't a know. snowball chance in hell. No. Reducing inequality. Well, it's a good idea. We have to reduce inequality. But I see inequality increasing. And oh. organizing the economy around human needs while scaling down unnecessary commodity production. Okay, <laughs> try not having children. That's a good start. If you want to achieve any of this, stop having kids, right? And Empirical we can all say evidence. stop buying stuff, but that's hard sometimes when we live in where it's we're slaves well, to you, it. You. Yeah, I mean, you know, buy what you need. But really, well, need the exponential cover. factor of being a breeder is amazing. Empirical evidence shows that degrowth strategies can be deployed to achieve substantial reduction in resource use while providing good lives for all people. Mm. Okay, I hope so. That's However, utopian. yeah. As such a shift, this is not a utopian world. That's the problem. We live on no. a hell planet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah wrong planet. <laughs> hell planet. Utopia planet. Not the same thing. However, such a shift will require confronting the 
powerful network of think tanks, trade associations, lobby groups, philanthropic <laughs> foundations, and other actors that develop and spread misinformation, such as so-called green growth narratives, in an attempt to legitimize an unsustainable status quo. Yeah, there, like there are three key limitations to the present study that are worth discussing. One is that cumulative odor overshoot accounting is highly sensitive to the start date of the analysis. Starting in 1970, effectively erases excess resources that might have happened before this date, which has substan substantial distributional implications. For mm. instance, the USA has consumed resources in excess of eight tons per capita per year since uh. at least 1870. Good job, USA. When national records began, resource use in the USA increased particularly rapidly in the middle of the 20th century, more than doubling from 13 tons per capita in 1932 to 29 tons per capita in 1970. That's why everybody hates us. Yes, well, mm. man, there's a reason they hate us. Mm. Due to, in large part, to infrastructure build out, we can assume that the UK the EU and most other high income nations followed a similar trajectory during the same period, yet excess resource use during this period is absent, effectively forgiven in the cumulative accounts presented here. Yeah. By contrast, nations in the global south that have industrialized more recently are penalized for the same activity because it happened within the analysis period. God damn, this wow. is so fucking nerdy. It is so nerdy. Oh my God. <clears throat> All right. There Hang are with everybody staying with us. Okay. And during a period of aggregate resource overuse, this issue is particularly evident in the case of China, China. where infrastructure build out has occurred primarily since 2000. Yes, right. Remember, that's we looked true. at that. We looked yeah. at that. And uh, Antonio talks about it as well, about China. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. They're, they're very much newcomer to this little party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if responsibility for excess resource use were to be calculated in a manner that accounted for asynchronous patterns of industrial development, the responsibility of the USA and the EU would be substantially higher than our results suggest. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility of of countries in the global south would probably be lower. Huh. This dynamic okay. explains much of the difference between the results of this study and those of a previous study on the responsibility for excess CO2 emissions. It's great. <clears throat> because the CO2 analysis covered a longer time period from, 19, from 1850 to 2015. That's a whole big baseline discussion. The USA was found to have a higher share of responsibility, 40%. Whereas China was found to be still within its fair share of the planetary boundary. Because you look at the history of it, as we yeah. said, China is a newcomer. Yeah. However, the two studies are not directly compatible because the CO2 emissions overshoot was quantified according to the longitudinal budget. Whereas material use overshoot is quantified in this study according to the annualized boundary. A second limitation has to do with the aggregated nature of the boundaries, particularly abiotic resource use. The analysis could potentially be deepened by disaggregating abiotic materials, i.e. Wow. into the constructive categories of metals, non-metallic non mi minerals, and fossil fuels. I'm getting even down so, to the nitty gritty. They really did. They took care of it. But they could eat. They're talking about even going deeper. I know. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I know. They, they really did. I mean, this is a good this is deep really dive well, into, yes. into aggregation of every single thing. 
right and how it affects everything and then the whole thing over this thing divided by that thing and this thing and then you got the thing then you got the thing (laughs) so Um, as to determine responsibility for more specific (laughs) environmental pressures However, well, that's what they're talking about. Environmental pressure is needed to quantify material specific boundaries that disaggregated values could be compared with. A third mm-hmm. limitation has to do with the annualized nature of the material use boundary. The boundary does not diminish no matter how much or how, for how long it is transgressed. In reality, if we have used too much in the past, Less will be available in the future. Yeah, right? It's like funny economics. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Ultimately, what matters is how much we are using versus the capacity of ecosystems. A message that that indicators such as ecological footprint continue to convey. Oh, boy. Other approaches for assigning national fair share fair shares could be explored to account for the difference between countries. Colder regions might require more buildings and infrastructure, for example, or share responsibility for excess resource use between consumers and producers. What? Get along with other countries? (laughs) Oh, sure. Sure, Jen. It It is important to note that there is substantial variation of responsibility within countries, given that rich individuals consume more than poor individuals. However, ultimately, a country's aggregate resource use is an effect, is an effect of its economic model and provisioning systems. So the concept of responsibility is best understood as pertaining to the national level where policy decisions and regulatory time frameworks are determined. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. In conclusion, (laughs) this one was hard. hard, We made it. It's hard, hard, hard. A fair shares assessment of resource use shows that get it. If you didn't listen to anything else, listen to the (laughs) high income nations bear the overwhelming responsibility for global ecological breakdown and therefore owe an ecological debt to the rest of the world. Yep. These nations need to take the lead in making radical reductions in their resource use to avoid further degradation, which will likely require transfer transformative post growth and degrowth approaches. She did it. Woo. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you that I think that these nations that are the high using, high abusing nations, they get Goodbye. <laughs> we did it. We oh. did it. We well, did it. We, we did it. And actually, that was it was sensational work. I mean, Jennifer, it really was sensational it was work. Thick. It was hard it to was get through great. that. But yeah. I, I, I'm so glad we did. I learned I so too. much because now that was like the fourth time going through it. And I still oh did God. not. And I'm so glad. I love when we're tag team and you pick up where I get stumbly over the, like, the <laughs> statistics. It was just perfect. We're All taking right. care of each other, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. It was perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Bo- Poppy says the, the hopium is pretty thick. No, it's not. There's really no hopium other than it's a framework for policymakers that are <laughs> never going to use it, or maybe they will. And I, I mean, I could see people trying, you know, but anyway. I mean, it's good. At least they got a grip on what affects what, how it all works, who's used what and how much and for how long. That's essentially yeah, what they've gone go. through. They're like, what the fuck have we been doing for the last 50 years? Here it is. Blah. And then Boom. they showed it to you this way, this way, this way, and this way. And then you go, oh, I can see the U.S. has fucked the world. And so has Europe. China's <laughs> trying to do it. I mean, that's basically what it was, right? <laughs> it was. But it was so well done. Thank you, it Lancet. Was. 
All right. Yeah, thanks, we, Lance. We, 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 we're going to move on because we have been, we, we can't seem to go, we can't seem to stay under an hour because we have some more interesting stuff. Jennifer, why don't we go right to um, Ghana right. and I show this video. Okay, I'm going to show yeah. a little video. Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll watch this, take an intermission for a second and see what's happening here. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the floods here. And uh, there's been heavy floods uh, after uh, a few minutes of downpour this morning in the capital. Some roads in parts of the city have been rendered immutable. Some people were seen scooping flood water out of their homes to save their valuables. Part of the ministry's area were also flooded. John News' Michael Ashale is joining us from town uh, on the phone. Well, Michael, which areas have you been and what have you observed? Yeah, so we have been to areas like Kamishi, Zongo, um, Gaskia, and some other areas around uh, the Kolibu um, Hospital. And, and the situation is dire for some of these people. Even with a huge drain, uh, these rains have been able to collect in them. They filled up and they are all over the street, making some of the roads um, in more trouble. The drivers could not even navigate to where the drains could be, resulting in, in, a, in a traffic for some of the people, residents around the areas. Uh, these rains have managed to fill up their homes. Uh, there was one lady that was sitting on top of her, her building waiting for the rains to, to subside before she gets back into it. Some of them um, have lost their businesses. There was one lady who said, oh, she's lost everything. All the food that she prepared for today um, has all gone bad because of the rain, which she didn't know um, were going to come. So these people are still counting. Um, they are course, a very big situation for them. Papani, thank you very much for bringing us that update and we have more for you in our subsequent bulletins. You're watching Journeys Today with me and Asmini. We're taking a break when we return. We have more stories for you plus the latest in business, sports and showbiz. Stay with us. We are freaking muted, and I didn't even know it. I'm so sorry. It's my fault. I went through all that. Yeah, I didn't realize it. We were muted. I'm going to then just say what Dolly Parton, we are segueing from 
and I'm very sorry we were muted. I didn't see it. We are segueing from the enormity of the other article to the simplicity of Dolly Parton and her message to people that she can resonate because she's a public figure and that resonate with her in a non-political, non-threatening way. And forgive me for the... Uh, I, I'm sorry. So... Here she goes from her Tennessee mountain. The Smokies have always called home. And she says, um, she says, mistreating the earth is like being ugly to your mama. And I said it before, so we have a little block there. The Smokies always call me home. And millions go to her Tennessee birthplace, though not many of them were born in a little one-room shack on the banks of the Little Pigeon River as the singer, songwriter, and tourism titan was. So last month, my Tennessee Mountain home, her 1972 homage to the uh, the um, corner of the play country where she lives in the United States, right? Uh, she grew up, was named an official state song. The accolade, it, it points out, I can't play it, guys, because I'll get a copyright, but the accolade points out to how much this region has both inspired her through the years and been inspired by her. So in its place where, as she sings in the song, life, life is as peaceful as a baby's sigh, where crickets and sing in the fields nearby. And it's a place where she returns not just to recharge, but to nurture and share the regional enhancement that fuels her phenomenal creativity and estimable energy, right? At 76, 76 years old, Jennifer, she is wow. still going. She seems to be working a lot more than nine to five because she's everywhere. She's in your bookstore and in the news, country music awards on a cake box, um, ice cream pint. Later this year, she'll be starring in a Christmas TV movie and putting out a new gospel album. She, and there's where it is in case you don't know, in Tennessee. She has built a hospitality empire centered in Pigeon Ford that includes Dollywood Amusement Park. Now, that's, see, now all of this is probably the epitome of consumption, right? Uh, dream Resort, restaurants and attractions, all themed to celebrate the landscape and culture of the Smokies. Although the wilds may sometimes be hard to discern among uh, the touristy glitz and kitsch. What drives Parton is a genuine desire to vis to invite visitors to one of the most beautiful places in the world. She says, and when I came here, it's a feeling like nothing else. It has grown, as all things must. But the Smokies, they'll never lose their charm and magic. Look how beautiful, Jennifer. No, oh, they're so gorgeous. That's lovely the way the clouds form along the river there wow. in the valleys. So gorgeous. Wow. Hey, somebody's been there. Jack said Dollywood is amazing. Let me put it up. Dolly, Dollywood is what, uh, amazing. You got to try their pastries. <laughs> That's cool. Although, I, 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 yeah, it is the height of consumption, but it's her message. So yeah. she talks about, you want to take it or you want me to keep going? Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. We're not muted. <laughs> yep. Okay. I'm ready to go. Here's what Parton sees in her Tennessee mountain home and what travelers can take away from a visit. Our Lady of Tennessee, born the fourth of 12 children. Wow. Parton began singing at the age of 10 on regional radio in Knoxville. As a teen, she was already a local star. The day after graduating Sevier County High School in 1964, she poured herself a cup of ambition and set off for Nashville. She's been going strong ever since, her star power propelling her around the world and across entertainment genres. The award-winning 2019 podcast series, Dolly Parton's America, dubbed her the great unifier, citing the way she manages to draw together a diverse range of fans who might not otherwise stand to be in the same room with each other. Yet, she remains a local girl. She has lived 57 years in Nashville 
with her, her publicity shy husband, Carl D., whom she married in 1966. She returned several times a year to Sevier County, including opening a new season of Dollywood with a performance here in the epicenter of the Dollyverse, Parton's influence is obvious. In Knoxville, there's the colorful mural <clears throat> of her in, the, in an alleyway in a bookstore with a section devoted to Dolly-themed books and merchandise. Oh. There's a parkway named after her and a bronze statue in Servierville that her father would visit regularly to keep clean. Oh, that's sweet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But her impact goes beyond her image. The Dollywood Foundation awards college scholarships to local high school students, a monthly book giving program that started for children under the age of five has grown to a lauded international initiative called Imagination Library. Recently, a Dollywood Serve Years <clears throat> County biggest employer announced it would pay full tuition for employees pursuing higher education. She is very active in causes that speak to her heart, says Jessica Hall, executive director of the American Eagle Foundation, which runs a bald eagle sanctuary at Dollywood. And the Smoky Mountains where she grew up, that's where her heart is. Dolly's Mountain Home. Parton may be ubiquitous in Eastern Tennessee, but when she looks around, she sees a unique ecosystem whose beauty is beyond compare. Quote, we've got the most radiant flowers, <clears throat> the biggest assortment of trees, she says. The Smokies have a heart of their own. It's the way the water flows, the way it sounds, the way it feels when you get in it. I don't know if it's because it's my home. I really don't think so. I think it's just one of those special places that God put here for us to enjoy. Visitors might be surprised to learn how special the place really is. The Great Smoky Mountains is the most biodiverse park in the U.S. National Park System. The Smokies have support of more than 1,400 varieties of flowering plants and about 100 species of tree which is also more than the whole of Europe. Wow. <clears throat> Yellowstone is known for geysers. The Smokies are known, known for its plant diversity, said Mount O'Barrell, general manager of Pink Adventure Tours, which offers guided tours of the national park in a pink Jeep. The numerous streams that help to nurture this abundance from headwaters of the Pigeon River to Lacant Creek draw locals and visitors for kayaking, fishing, and swimming. Parton's lyrics as a guide from Klingman's Dome, the highest point in the park, might watch the light of a clear blue morning as it eventually fades to glow in fireflies when evening shadow falls. And over there, mm. on a distant hilltop, an eagle spreads its wings. And Quote. this is where this is where <clears throat> she appeals to people that would never think about that may never think about any kind of environmental conservation. Who look at it as like political, and that this may be, you know, her her Dollywood and all that over the top uh, kind of. Maybe grotesque to some, you know, but it's the it's the it's the connection. Maybe she will wake people up. Certainly, as a little girl, she saw bald eagles and other birds of prey in her Smoky Mountain home, said Hall. At its Dollywood facility, the American Eagle Foundation rescues and rehabilitates injured and orphaned bald eagles, owls, vultures, and other birds. If they are not able to be released back into the wild, they find a home as they find a home as educational ambassadors to the more than three pe three million people a year who visit Dollywood. Wow! Look at that with that little doll that is her. <laughs> that 19, is pretty weird. Yeah, I know. Nineteen seventy-seven. That's her. Oh, God, our American culture. <laughs> oh, my <Jeez>. God. <laughs> uh. 
two but days. Sweet. We've released over 180 bald eagles into the wild in the Smoky Mountains, said Hall. It's incredible. We've tracked our bald eagles in Ohio and Florida. We feel strongly that we have played a small but important role in the repopulation of the bald eagle in the South. Hall notes that Dollywood, as the foundation's largest corporate sponsor, has been instrumental in our success. The organization plans to open a new public facility in Serverville in the spring of 2023, and she says it will be the nation's largest bald eagle education and rehabilitation center. That's impressive. Well, see, that's the sweet part. <clears throat> and I, I think our chat's freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me this article to read. No, I know. I'm I know, just I know. reading it. My I'm whole just reading thing, it. My, and we're going to move down and show the pictures. But my whole thing was the, the, the juxtaposition, the difference between what we were reading about overshoot, right? And then how nobody, like, look, 70 million people voted for Donald Trump in this country that don't have a clue. And if they see somebody and she does talk about climate change, she says, she says, you know, perhaps there's just a, a, a little glimmer of, of hope that people can get educated. That was my whole point in bringing Dolly Parton <laughs> It's a light, guys. <laughs> I haven't checked the chat, Sandy. I, I just that, was looking. But I can only imagine <laughs> that it's just... Well, I, I'll give you the... Wait, 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 wait. Let, let's see. Let's give you the... Okay. Which I don't... I mean, I don't... Humpty Dumpty tribe. Yes. <laughs> Dollywood certainly is a monument to how to honor the Smoky Mountains. It makes a mountaintop removal coal mine look like a Sunday walk in the park. Now oh I don't God. know if I. I mean, I, I have you. I, I have not been there, and I was not. It, again, I haven't been there either. I'm touched because of the of the even with the small effort of bald eagles, and she has talked about climate change to a community that just absolutely has either they're they're so inundated with denialism you know that maybe someone like dolly could that's all so simple as compared to overshoot dealings oh my god anyway well we really have gone around the world because yep. you know we we covered the artwork that beautiful artwork then we dive deep into the lancet i mean that was very nerdy like to to say the least and then into dolly parton that's a real juxtis, juxtaposition that's oh what yeah we're good it. for like holy crap we've been around the world for sure and that's what we are good for these are M marty mccorkle's pieces again yeah beautiful stuff you'll see his mm -hmm. his uh website yeah oh well i th i listen we're on yeah. an unusual channel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we yeah, choose yeah, 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 unusual yeah. things. I don't yeah, think yeah, yeah. anyone could uh, ever uh, uh, accuse us as uh, uh, being run a run of the mill channel <laughs> at all. And I perhaps like not. Perhaps not. <laughs> I, like it. I like it. I don't know if anybody else could go through our, what, the machinations of how we plan our shows, but we get from A to Z pretty good. Thanks, Jen. That's right. Thank Thanks. you, Sandy. <laughs> All right. I do have an announcement, a real quick one. Wednesday, I have a guest. Uh, I have Dr. Felice Todd is coming back. Oh, good. Yeah. It's Wednesday, good. though. It's it's 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. I can send you a link, Jen, if you want. I know you're working, but um, we will be doing a show, and, and that will be Wednesday. That's when she can go live with me and, and so we do it according to when she can do it all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right guys thank you for coming everyone <laughs> if you're uh, a member of uh our little go buy me a coffee thank you very much again and jen finish us off well you know i mean it's it's been a show of contrasts and um yes. i'm very happy that that whole study in the lancet that we went through it so it's good you finally can get your handle around things but now knowing that what do you do with it and that's kind of how it rolls out and then a little bit of dolly parton at the end which was very sweet i wish i could have played her 
she's a she's a kitty. <clears throat> I wish I could have played her, but <laughs> I don't want a copyright. So no more copyright strikes. No more copyright strikes. We're gonna play it safe. <laughs> yeah. Peace out, guys. Fate. Mwah. <laughs> we love you. We do.